back, everyone. Next up, we have Silver Bullet Mines. It was just listed on the TSXV under the symbol SBMI and is an overnight success 10 years in the making. It expects to be in silver production at its Buckeye Silver Mine near Globe, Arizona in Q1 2022, to be followed by the McMorris Mine within 24 months. Silver Bullet Mines is in the pre-production sweet spot. So attendees, please submit all your questions for Silver Bullet Mines through this webinar module. And let's welcome its CEO, Peter Klossy. Welcome, Peter. Hi, Anna, how are you? Great. We're excited to hear your presentation. Take it away. Thank you so much. And I'm not the CEO. John Carter of Oakville, Ontario is. We call him Boss John. Uh, John has experience in building over 100 mills around the world. So we have a lot of confidence that we're going to get this job done correctly. I'm a director and the VP of Capital Markets. I can talk for as long as you like or as little and answer every question you have. Silver Bullet Mines is an overnight success 10 years in the making. That is our tagline because it's true. Over the past year and a half, we've raised $6.2 million Canadian and accelerated the business plan at the mine site. So we own a massive property in Arizona. It's almost 5,000 acres. It's called the Black Diamond property. It's host to at least five former silver producers. We have executed on the business plan and we will put the Buckeye silver mine back into production in Q1 of 2022. It would have been in production already, but for supply chain issues out of uh, Cal um, China and then through the port in, ports in California. I'm sure you've all heard about these supply chain issues. Our first two bins were delayed. Our third bin is somewhere in the water off Long Beach. We hope to have it at site by the end of January and have the mill up and running in pilot production in March. So that puts us in what's called the pre-production sweet spot. A lot of research has been done on companies just prior to going public, just prior to going into production, and then going public and into production. And the term pre-production sweet spot is there for a reason. Companies such as this have generated a greater return for its investors than have other companies uh, where that aren't in the pre-production sweet spot. The second mine we're going to put back into production is a fun one called the McMorris Mine. That's the source of the legend of the Lone Ranger Silver Bullets. It's one of the reasons why we named the company Silver Bullet Mines. Originally, the Apache smelted silver and shot it at the wagon trains crossing their lands. The author of the Lone Ranger stories heard these stories and inverted them to make the Lone Ranger's bullets the symbol of uh, the sheriff coming to town and cleaning up. We figure it'll take about 24 months of confirmation and exploration to get the McMorris mine right. Um, there's a 1987 report, which of course predates NI 43101, so the usual caveats and disclaimers apply. But an engineer named Arturo did a gross economic analysis of just the McMorris, which is about 20% of the, our property. And in 1987, using $7 silver and $450 gold, he calculated a gross economic value of roughly 480 million US just on the McMorris. That historical document is available. And uh, I reran the numbers using modern assumptions and I came to some interesting numbers. I encourage you to do the same. That document is available at our website. The next stage of the business plan in Arizona is to put a third mine into production. We're not sure which one yet. Exploration work has to be done to confirm the silver veins. What's interesting about this project is we've done the, the old Pat Sheridan model. Any of you old time investors there know Pat Sheridan passed away a few years ago. Pat didn't like PEAs. Pat didn't like resource estimates. He didn't like raising money just to pay a geologist to tell you what you already knew. If you know where the mineralization is, Go get it. And that's the model we've adopted. Our technical team, our field team are fantastic. They know where the mineralization is. So we're going to skip the PEA, skip the resource estimate, and we will be in pilot production in Q1. I can't tell you how much because we don't have a PEA. I can tell you that our mill is uh, nameplated at 125 tons a day. And I like to use math of a mill running 80% of capacity, so that's 100 tons a day. I like to assume 
300 producing days a year. That leaves roughly five days a month for cleanup, shutdown, breakdown, repairs, maintenance, that kind of thing. When our Q1 financials come out, you'll be able to see what our expenses per cost per ounce are. So if you know tonnage per day, number of producing days, the silver price, cost per ounce, make an assumption as to grade, and you have just figured out cash flow. Once you've figured out cash flow, you can start to make an appropriate valuation of the company. You have to make adjustments for the expiration upside at the other mines and for our property in Idaho. Okay, a couple of questions that I'll get to later. Um, Idaho has been a spectacular surprise for us. A gentleman unfortunately passed away in the fall of 2020 and his family offered to sell us the Washington mine. Our CEO, John Carter, had reviewed the Washington mine on prior occasions and was a big fan of it. So we reached terms fairly quickly, raised a little bit of money and bought the Washington mine. We tucked it to the side, not expecting to get to it yet. But with the supply chain issues out of China and through California, we thought it might be time to accelerate the search in Idaho. And so we have a field team there. We expect a press release in Idaho in the next week or so with some the results of some grab samples that we ran at our assay lab. And if the supply chain issues continue, we'll just pivot to Idaho and do a lot of work there. Idaho is fascinating. I, I'm just a lawyer. What do I know? So I learned from the people who do know. Historically, at the Washington mine, there are two different geologic eras. A gold vein was laid down in one geologic era and a silver vein in a different geologic era. The only reason that matters is when you're mining it, you can easily tell which is which because the host rocks are different. When this property was mined in the late 1880s, silver was 70 cents an ounce. Nobody wanted silver. So the miners hauled that rock up the surface and simply dumped it unprocessed on surface. So no tailings, no slag, just rock mineralized rock. So we're sending the team in to look at that mineralized rock and tell us what grade they think it is and what we can do with it. That's the overall story. Back in, uh, in production in Q1 2022, put the McMorris into production, figure out which of the other three mines goes into production, and get up to Idaho and figure out what's going on there. The question about uh, title to the lands. Um, the majority of the property has no advanced royalties on it uh, and minor relative to the size of the package. The payments are quite small. We own our own mill site, which is fascinating. Um, it's 65 acres, about a kilometer away from the Buckeye mine. So we will process our own materials. We also own our own assay lab. People ask, why do you own your assay lab? Well, working a silver vein is different from gold. With gold, often you can't see the, the, the gold. There's no visible gold. You can't chase a vein. So you have to take a lot of samples and really map out where you think the deposit is. Some of our veins are six to seven feet wide. Very easy to see, very easy to trace. But you want to make sure you're pulling the high-grade sections out of the vein. So uh, let's say Monday morning at 9 o'clock, we can stand in front of the vein face, go grab, 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 run those samples through the mill, through the assay lab, and the next day we will know where the high-grade portion of that vein is, and we can chase the high-grade section, leave the low-grade for later. Having our own assay lab means we don't have to wait. But good QA, QC means that occasionally we will send duplicates to an independent third-party lab just to make sure that our practices are correct and that our QA, QC is on. Up in Idaho, we own it 100%. It's on patented lands, so the permitting requirements are a lot less. Questions? All right, Peter, are you ready for questions? You're done with your presentation? I am. Oh, by the oh. way, we do have a formal presentation, but we'll send it around later. Okay. Well, we do have some questions from our audience. Um, Jeff Copeland wants to know, what are the terms of the raise? The raise was completed at 30 cents with a half warrant at 50 cents. And James Morgan wants to know what majors are producing around you and how close are they? Oh, um, gosh, the closest one is 10 kilometers away to the Southwest. 
The name escapes me for a second. It's in the map. Uh, but it's a massive copper project. The majors are all around us and have walked our properties. We have NDAs with two of them. Carl L. asks, do you need to raise more money to get to production, or is your current capital sufficient to get you to cash flow positive? Our goal is to get to cash flow positive without needing another raise. Uh, we had to raise a, million, a minimum of $3 million to close the transaction. We raised 6.2. That tells you how well received the transaction was. I'd like to think we structured it correctly, um, and the, re the response from the investing public shows that we probably did. Uh, if we do raise money, it'll be through the exercise of warrants, which are out there at 50 cents. We're expecting a strong response to the upcoming series of uh, news flow that we're going to have. And hopefully we'll raise money only through the exercise of warrants and don't dilute the shareholders. Carl L. wants to know, do you need to raise more money to get to production or is your current capital sufficient to get you to cash flow positive? No, no, th this should be enough. This should be enough unless there's a disaster coming through California with our third bin, this should be enough. And should disaster happen with bin number three, we'll just go to Idaho. Now, in theory, if the mineralization is strong enough, Anna, you can rent the backhoe, I'll get a dump truck, and we'll drive up on the weekend, we'll just load the dump truck, drive it down the road to the custom mill, and take a 60% margin, which is common in the industry. So we do have that alternative open to us. You can drive a dump truck, right? No. Oh. <laughs> that's, that's not in my wheelhouse. <laughs> Uh, Larry Tyler wants to know, can you talk about any proven reserves on the property? No, nope, we don't have a 43101. Okay. And Roy E. says, what's your cash, cash position and is it enough to survive until March? Yes, we have about a million five in the bank. Everything's been paid for already. We have a bulldozer. We have an LHD, a uh, loader hauler dumper, which you use underground to load the ore, dump it into the bin, and then that goes and it dumps it into the thing that takes it to the surface. So we have our own LHD. Uh, all the equipment that's in bins one, two, and three has been paid for. E&D wants to know, are you two years from seeing production? And if not, when do you see it beginning? Q1, 2022. There we go. Frank Green asks, what percentage of your estimated production is gold versus silver versus copper? Good question. Uh, the Buckeye silver mine is all silver. We expect virtually no gold credits there. At the McMorris, there will be gold credits. Up in Idaho, we're still trying to figure it out because when they dump those waste rocks on surface, it's inevitable that some gold got mixed in with it. We're just trying to figure out how much now, and that should be in the next press release uh, with the uh, silver and the gold. As for the copper, um, our 43101 technical report speaks of a copper porphyry underlying the entire Richmond Basin. We had a major walk the property who signed an NDA who wanted to know where the smelter was. We said, smelter? What do you mean? The soil samples were so high, he said. The only explanation is there was a smelter uh, downwind that blew into us. There's no smelter. Uh, there's the strong possibility of a copper porphyry underlying our entire 5,000 acres. Wow. Courtney Rhodes says, in 2022, you'll be producing which quarter in that year and which metals will you be producing first? Silver, out of the Buckeye, with pilot production in Q1 2022. So my personal math, I map these things out and I work backwards. My best guess is the second week of March, just after PDAC, we'll be punching silver from our mill down at the Buckeye. Great. Dixon W. asks, do you have any convertible notes? No, nope, no debt other than normal trade payables. Lenny Ward wants to know, does the company currently have an audit? Oh, we're a public company. So, yes, all the, the audit, the public, the, the private company was audited as part of the go public process. And uh, every three months we'll file unaudited and annually there'll be audited statements with MDA. We're lucky to have a gentleman named Burks Bovert is on our board. And some of you mining investors know Burks. He's the chair at Energy Fuels, which is the only urani real uranium producer in the United States, and it's processing rare earths. Burks is an expert at compliance and governance. He's our chair, and he will help to make sure that all of our filings are done, done correctly. Not just compliant, not just governance, but compliance. Right? It's really those are two different concepts. It's like everybody knows that a tomato is a fruit. 
but also everybody knows you don't put it in a fruit salad. So there's a little wisdom that gets applied to it, and Burks brings with him that level of wisdom. That's a good analogy. All right. Uh, Teddy Drake wants to know, do you plan to list on any other exchanges like the OTC? Yes. Um, discussions are underway. Uh, everybody loves a winner, as you know. So Monday when our stock came out, we ate a million shares. Price went up. Um, got contacted by everybody. Every IR firm, everybody had their hand up. Hey, come play with us, as well as all of the OTC service providers. We've done this before. Uh, so we have a network of people that we've used at good pricing who know how to get it done correctly. So we expect to be OTC, quote, soon. I don't know if that's a month, two months, three months, but it's not a year out. And after that, we'll probably get to Frankfurt. Florence C. wants to know, where do you see these commodity prices going over the next 24 months? I have no more control over that than I have over my two-year-old granddaughter. <laughs> so I'm... Who knows, right? We have so many factors at play right now between variants of the vaccine, variants of the virus, how seriously people are taking it, hyperinflation, stagflation. And are we going to, is there going to be a war uh, between China and India? There are so many factors beyond our control. We're just going to focus on what we can control, and that's operations and defending the Treasury. Sounds like a good plan. Pete Sanders wants to know do you have any joint ventures with any other major producers? No, we've decided not to, because we can't appropriately value what we have. Let's say somebody showed up with $25 million and wants to buy 40%. Is that the right number? Until we do some expiration, until we get into production, we have no idea if that's a correct valuation for the shareholders. And if we don't need the cash, don't take it. Colleen Todd wants to know if these properties are leased and what is the terms? There's a small portion of the Buckeye mine that's leased from a family in California. And I think uh, I think it's $30,000 a year U.S., but I can check on that and get back to you. The rest of it is either patented or just your basic BLM. Roy E. wants to know how many years of production is possible for the Buckeye mine? Uh, there was a mine down the road from us, the homestead, that ran for, I believe, 80 years. The, the cool thing about vein-based systems, and one of the reasons why we didn't get a resource estimate, is it's impossible to predict that vein. Is it a kilometer long? Is it two kilometers long? Like every vein, it will pinch and swell. Does it break off into two veins? You would have to drill the entire property every 25 meters to be able to answer that question. But with veins that wide, we expect an extended number of production years. Fascinating stuff. Uh, Kirk Pittman Marcy, wants to know, or any silver, of these mine, sorry. Sorry, Anna. Silver is really different from gold, right? Silver is rarely a primary metal being produced. It's usually a byproduct of nickel, a byproduct of copper. It's a throw-in. So you have to adjust your thinking a bit when silver is your primary. Absolutely. Uh, so Kirk Pittman wants to know, were any of these mines previously producing? And if so, do you know why the why they closed and what will it cost you to restart them versus starting on a virgin property? We do have internal costs for the McMorris, which is the second. Yes, it did produce. Uh, there were three other mines that were producers. So to be called a mine is different from a deposit or a project. In 43101 lingo, if you're calling it a mine, it better have produced. Otherwise, call it something else. So there are smaller artisanal mines on the property, but we don't have any documentation on them, so we don't talk about them. There are five documented former producers on the property. We've always said that it'll cost between a million and a million and a half to get the Buckeye into production, and we're on budget for that. One thing that threw off our budget is the cost of shipping, not threw it off, but bumped it up, was the cost of shipping from China. Last January, our first container cost this many thousand dollars. The last one cost 34000 just to rent space in the shipping container. So the supply chain has been a real pain for us, and Boss John has done a great job of navigating and getting all of our parts to where they need to be. You addressed this earlier, but it's a good question to just talk about. Uriel Weiss asks, what is the lifetime of the mines? No idea. No idea. Now, I'd be able to tell you about Idaho because that's just rock on the surface. And after I get the mineralization numbers back from the geologists, uh, we'll be able to make a fair guess as to that. 
But with the other mines, it's all vein-based. It's impossible to predict a vein-based system. Look at Anaconda Mining, which is in Newfoundland. It's been mining for 15 years off of vein. Its original PEA was 30,000 ounces of gold. And 15 years later, it's still punching that same vein. Wow. Yeah. Uh, uh, Emilio Mathis asks, who is your uh, current auditor? And is your audit a gap audit, or do you have to convert it to gap? GAAP is a clumsy form of accounting. We conform to IFRS, which is the International Financial Reporting Standards. Uh, we're governed by CPAB, who in turn reports to the international body that I think is based in Belgium. Jake Oliver wants to know, how close is your base to these properties? I don't understand that question. Sorry, Anna. Um, maybe where's your office? Where is your home base? So the... Headquarters? Uh, Okay, so the official office is in Ontario, in Burlington, a city of about 130,000 people. Um, our CEO lives in Oakville, Ontario, but we have a field team in Globe, Arizona, who lives in Globe, who've worked this property in the 1980s, and who know the property intimately. Roy E. wants to know, how much experience does management have in putting a mine into production? It's an excellent question. I've been involved in putting a, a large mine in Mexico into production, but I was a bit player on a much larger team. Like our budget was 30,000 items in the but line items in the budget. Uh, so I was involved in that. I've been involved in taking some deposits and advancing them, but this is the first time we've done it this way. What gives me a lot of confidence is our CEO's experience in building mills around the world. Johnny is now 68, I think. I've known John so long we forgot where we met. And he has built over 100 mills and processing facilities around the world. This is his world. Uh, he designed the flow chart. He designed the mill. He sourced the parts. He negotiated for them. This is his world. And I take a lot of comfort from that. Morris M. wants to know, what other properties do you have in your sites? In what regions, if any? So we have the Black Diamond, which is the 5,000 acre in Arizona. We have the Washington Mine in Idaho. And we have a greenfield out in Nevada. And we'll get to that when we get to that. It's always nice to have a property in another juris jurisdiction in case things go bad. It's just a good risk mitigation technique, but Nevada's not high on our list right now. Jerry Neal wants to know what your team, where your team is located geographically. Now, you answered this earlier, but if you'd like to repeat that so that we all sure. um, know where your headquarters are and where you all are versus your mines. I'm in the Niagara Peninsula. My goal is to be on site when the third bin arrives. Uh, I love walking properties because you know, being only a lawyer, I don't understand the geology as well as a geologist would. So I love getting to site, walking around, filling the rocks with my feet and having it pointed out to me. Our CFO is based in Burlington. Our CEO is in Oakville. Uh, we have a director in Arizona in Globe um, and two others in Toronto. And Toronto, as you probably know, is the mining finance capital of the world. Last question for you. Otis Fuller wants to know, what don't you have that you need to be ultimately successful and how will you get it? That third freaking bin. I want that third <laughs> bin. The uh, motor <laughs> and the chain for the bowl mill are in there. Uh, we have a very active Twitter feed. The field team's been great about sending us pictures and videos. So people have been able to see the mill get assembled part by part as the bins have arrived, which has been fun. Uh, we're ready for the third bin. We're ready to install it. Just, I need that third bin. And it makes me frustrated. Poor boss John loses his mind every day over it. Peter, do you have any closing remarks? Pre-production sweet spot. I didn't make up that phrase. The due diligence guy did. Um, I've coined it. I always give him credit for it. If you do research on the pre-production sweet spot, we are in it. Risk mitigated with a high ceiling. Well, it's a fascinating industry you're in, and we really appreciate your time and presentation on our conference. Please join us again with some updates. Absolutely, Anna. We'll send the presentation around with the website address. Thank you for your time today. Perfect. Thank you, Peter. All right, everyone, as we transition to the next presenter, remember you're going to see a blank screen for a second, but stay with us. We're coming back with some more exciting companies.